it's just been wonderful on the expedition to have you guys along. Uh, it was a real top expedition, and um, uh, the whole crew. We had a film crew there. We had um, other explorers with us, and we just you put smiles on our faces. So you kept us going during the expedition. So I just want to thank you for that, and I'm really excited about the link today. So I'm looking forward to some good questions. Who would like to go first? Come on up. Come up to the seat so we can make right up here. So we can make sure we see you right on camera. There we go. Come up. See your face there. And you introduce yourself. Hi, my name's Simone. Good question. Good on. Good, good name, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> How high did you go? How many feet above sea level? Above sea level. 8,325 meters. Meters. I don't know what that is in feet. It's probably something around about 26,000 feet or something like that. 27 maybe. Somebody will have to look at that for me. But 8,325, yeah. So when we looked down, we could see 3,000 meters below me, below me, was the top of the clouds. Yeah, well, so when you're flying in the, you're flying in the aeroplane on an international flight, you're probably flying at about 30,000 feet, and that's the height that we were at. Uh, how many camps did you stay at? Uh, there's four camps all together heading up. So camp one, base camp, well, you got base camp, and then camp one uh, above the ice glacier. And then you've got Camp 2, which is in a tremendously hot area, because it's encased in the mountains, so it's very warm. Camp 3, which is a place called the Lossy Base, very dangerous area with avalanches. And then Camp 4 is just below the, the ascent of Everest at 8,000 meters. So. Uh, how much equipment did you have on you? Uh, actually, carrying up the mountain, I had very little stuff. So it was a sleeping bag, um, food, tent, and three oxygen cylinders. Because you can't breathe for a sustained amount of time up there without oxygen. You, you've got 30% less oxygen in your body. And actually the blood with it that goes around you in your veins is almost like thick soup that's moving very, very slow. It's got very little oxygen in your body, so it's quite a dangerous area. So you can't really carry too much with you, right? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, some of the technical stuff. So I had um, a harness on with carabiners, a thing called a, a Juma, which is a like a carabiner, but you clip it onto a rope and you push it up and it holds the rope, it grips the rope, and then you can pull yourself up. So it's like an anchor, if you like, to pull yourself up. Um, a, a carabiner, if you don't know what that is, it's like a hook with a screw in it and you clip it on as a safety to the to the uh, to the rope that you're climbing up, um, an ice axe as well, which is always a good thing, um, and that's in case you slip down the mountain and you can dig the ice axe into the, the ice, and basically it's called a self arrest uh, arrest, so you rescue yourself. So they're the three main things: a helmet because the ice was falling on us, um, yeah, and a, a head torch I think, so so we can go through the night. Good questions. Introduce yourself. How are you doing? Give me a handshake, virtual handshake. <laughs> My question is that what inspired you to do it? Like, why did you want to? Um, you know, it's. I think I've said in the blogs that I do that when I went to the North and the South Pole, I've been to Alaska, I've been to magnetic pole, loads of expeditions over the years. It's not generally about getting to the pole or reaching the top of the mountain. What inspires me is this, is connecting with this fantastic school, you know, from across the world, who's followed me on my journey and has seen what we do directly from ice. And that's what is, is really important to me. The expedition wouldn't be anything if I didn't connect with the schools. And I feel tremendously passionate about that. So um, that's why I wanted to do a bigger and better expedition. And now I'm sure one of your questions will be, what are you doing next? But the next expedition is going to be even bigger 
uh, and it will involve a lot more students, and that's why I do it, and that's what, why my passion is there. So. You want to share with the students the yeah. science and... Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I give loads of talks like this, virtual talks, I give talks actually in schools. Hopefully one day I can come into your school and give a talk there. Yeah? But it, the three main things I talk about, or three main messages really, one is of how modern day explorers operate compared to old explorers. And, and, you, and you know, Perry was the first guy to the North Pole and he was American. Now, we do that, that's the first thing. The second thing is about um, the environment, about you guys taking a personal responsibility for the environment. You know, people always look towards your government, but it's about here first, about understanding this great planet you're on. And the third thing, which I find really exciting, I'm from a place called Coventry in the UK, which is a, a, a lovely town, but it's in the centre. It's near Shakespeare's uh, country, so Stratford-on-Avon, it's near there. But there's no mountains, and there's no sea or ice or anything around. So why does somebody who went to a school like yours actually get a chance in life to climb Everest or go to the North, the South Pole? How do I do that? And I do that because I think differently about life. And that's what I try and tell you guys to do. You know, you have, you can change your life like that in an instant just by changing your thought pattern. And it's about finding what you, what inspires you in life, what your interest is, and running with that. A lot of students when they leave school focus on the money or being famous or whatever it is. It's not about that, it's what inspires you inside and you run with that and you'll find you enjoy your life a lot better. And it can be anything. Anything in life. That makes sense. Yes. yes. What would you? What do you want to be in life? Do you, do you know at this stage? No, I don't. I really don't know yet. Oh, that's cool. I mean, that's. I mean, you're young. You're enjoying school. If you're having fun, that's the main thing. Because you'll find it will come later. I'm 46 years old. I still don't know what I want to do with my life. <laughs> that's it's been nice chatting to you. By the way, it's really nice. Thank you. Okay. Oh, hi, mate. Uh, hi, mate. Um, so, like, what part did you not like the most? Because, um, it's like, besides when you had to stop and you couldn't climb anymore, what other part did you not like? You know, I, I'll be honest with this. What I didn't like was the social side of the expedition. Now, <laughs> I'll explain that. If you look at my website, you'll see that my main life is based around polar exploration. So I go from the west coast of Antarctica to the South Pole, and it's one direct line. And it's hard, but I just keep pushing each day. With the Everest expedition, there was 1,200 people at base camp. Along the line to Everest, we'd go up, and then we'd come back down, and go up and come back down. We needed to acclimatize. And along that route, you meet many, many different people. Well, with me, I need to focus. I need to focus my mind and my body into trying to succeed in these hard places. And I found it very, very difficult. From being solo at the North and South Pole to being in this big city, if you like, at the Everest Base Camp, it was very difficult for me. Um, and of course, you're quite right, and very uh, you know, perceptive of you that you know, the tough part was actually turning back as well, so close to the summit, and I'm sure that one of the questions will discuss that. But, uh, good, good questions, these are very good. Since it's so cold, um, how many layers of clothes did you layer? Sorry, buddy, I'm not getting that. Can you say that again? Since it was so cold, how many layers of clothes did you layer? Well, you know, I'm a, a very, luckily, a very warm person, so um, yeah. my body can withstand quite low temperatures. Uh, every day in the South Pole was about minus 35. And your freezers, well the freezers in the UK are minus 18, so I don't know what yours are over there. So, you know, operating very cold temperatures. When I headed up to Everest on the very last morning, it was minus 45 with a wind chill and a side wind of, of 50 miles an hour. So it's tremendously cold and that's why a lot of people came down with frozen faces. Out of the darkness, I'll do this. Out of the darkness, faces were coming up to me like this. But they were frozen. And they were screaming at me saying, walk down, walk down. It's like being in a horror film. 
but I could withstand that because I knew how to operate in these conditions. So I basically had a base layer on, which is a very thin top like this, and then I had a, a down suit on, which is like a big sleeping bag, if you like. But I vented the side of it, so I opened up the zips, so I'll get, uh, I was too warm. <laughs> when everybody else was cold, I was actually gener generating a lot of heat. And the biggest killer within the, the cold regions is, is sweat. So if, you, if I kept that zipped up and I started sweating, and then I'd stop, then the, the minus 45 would freeze that moisture, and it would freeze around here where your heart and your lungs are, and I'd get hypothermia. So the idea is, is that to re regulate your, your heat temperatures. Does, does that make sense? So yeah, okay, that's good. You know when you're playing sports and you get really hot, and you need to like take your jacket off or something? It's the same concept. But imagine Tate stopping in minus 45. <laughs> also, what time would you stop like, the trip each day? Because if you get colder, that's the night time. Well, you, you know, we would move through the night time because it, for the pure reason of the sweating. So it moved during the cold. It's better to do that. It's very cold, but you know, the ice is solid. So it's not moving. The, if you move during the day, the ice would move around with you and the crevasses would open. So it's extremely dangerous. So we moved at night and we only reached, we only stopped when we reached our destination. So to each camp point, if you like. So, you know, in, in that con those conditions with that, that knowledge, you can start to understand how difficult this expedition actually was, you know. But you know how you succeed in this expedition? If you're ever going to do it with me, you succeed by preparing yourself physically and mentally. 80% of achievement is up here. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> For some reason, they got a big kick that you were drinking your coffee. You had to take a coffee break. <laughs> yeah, it's New York coffee. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Nice and loud. How much food did you need to bring? Okay, well, I'll do it in calories. Do you guys know what calories are? Yeah? Yes. yes. If you do, or if you don't. Calories is, is, is basically a measurement of food. So if I said that every day you guys burn about 1,500 calories, okay? and adults about 2,000 calories. So that's the amount of food that you need to take on to maintain a, a body weight or refuel, it's like refueling your car. I was burning six to 8,000 calories a day, which is a tremendous amount of food. So what we do is we, we, we take dehydrated food with us, which is just like, um, you know, you add water to it and you mix it up. Um, I don't know if you get pop noodles, like noodles, if you like, it's like adding water to noodles, and it hydrates it. But high calories in there, so we put fat in there and butter and things like that, and cheese, and we eat that. So, yeah. Okay, you're welcome. Hello. Hello. You, I was going to say the second one, but you only got part of the second one right. So, yeah, we've got snow and ice all around us, so we just basically make, melt down the ice, and then it gets really, you know, and we just add it to the water and we drink it as well. We don't drink cold water up there because it cools the, the body temperature down, eh? Um, so, yeah, that's what we do. And we never, we never um, drink yellow ice either. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you guys know that, yeah? Bye. Bye. <laughs> Hi. I'm Dwayne. Hello. Hi. You want to give a, a virtual high five? Virtual high five. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question that I have for you is, what was your scariest moment if you had one? 
uh, on this expedition, the scariest moment, I think, was when I was leading my team back down Everest. After we made that decision that night to turn around, my lead guide had collapsed through exhaustion. The second guide, his feet was freezing, and my doctor was with me, his feet were freezing. So out of the four-person team, three of the guys had dropped, and I was standing there thinking, okay. So we turned them around to get them down, but then it was a, a case of making sure that they were safe. The most dangerous part of an expedition is coming down because it's, it's so unsafe. So that was very, very scary, and it was only until we got to the tents that I could breathe a sigh of relief. But you're in pure duck. I will say this, and I'll be honest with you, and I know that I know the teachers won't mind me saying, but people died on the expeditions that night, not on our expedition. And 17 people died on Everest. So this is very, very serious stuff. Uh, this is absolutely serious, and I think students should know, you know, the, the depth that we go to to try and keep exploration safe and put the right message across to to young guys like you, you know. And my thing was that the decision I made that night was based on a human life, or three human lives, rather than the ego of reaching the top of the highest peak in the world. Does that make sense? Remember these are trained professionals too, guys. If you're trained people. You're welcome. <laughs> Did you have to sleep with the oxygen mask on? Yeah, I did. What's your name? Sorry. I hate doing. I like your t-shirt, by the way. The next soccer World Cup final has been held in Brazil, so you need to watch that in a few years. Okay. Uh, football's great, by the way. You should uh, support it. So. Um, so anyway, yeah, uh, yes, definitely. Above eight thousand is a death. Uh, seven and a half thousand is a death zone. So you need to have oxygen, and at night time we put that on and, and breathe uh, good oxygen. You need to maintain that body as it's going through. If your body starts dying, you see, if you don't have the, the oxygen going in. So that's actually a really good question. Great question. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Uh -oh, we don't have Sorry. Hello. My name is Adriana, and my question for you is, were you ever worried that you wouldn't make it? Yeah, I did, you know, this is, again, I'm going to be honest with you, because I don't, I'm not going to hide anything from you guys. My, my expertise comes in the polar regions, and you know, I've never really written out of a will. I never wrote a will out, but I wrote one at base camp because I just realized how dangerous this expedition was. So, you know, going up, every step was calculated for me. I've worked in rescue and military all my life. I've been on over 32 major expeditions, and this one is the one that scared me the most. Uh, I won't be rushing back to Mount Everest, but I will do it again another day. I will do it again. But it's, um, it, did take, it did take it out of me, really. Uh, yeah, I was very scared. This is good because I'm charging $100 for every question, so I'm making good money here. <laughs> that's when all the hands go down and don't ask any more questions. We got, we got some more. Oh, that's great. No, no, keep it coming. <laughs> Hello. Hi, my name's Carly. How you doing? I've got a, the very same ribbon that I wear sometimes in my hand. <laughs> Ah, oh, that's a nice question. Well, um, I've got a, I can show you a picture of my dog. Um, it's very, very cute. Um, but I miss my, my family, of course. Uh, and my friends. Let's just show you a picture of this. This dog's called Charlie. <laughs> He's like a mini Chipola bear. <laughs> I miss Charlie, I miss Charlie walking around the park with her and um, I, I miss my friends and that. Um, I miss the food that, that they, you know, the great food that the English make, you hear so much about. Um, uh, 
so yeah, it's, I miss a lot, but you know, I love going on expeditions, and I think it balances out, so the contrast of being on expedition and being at home, it makes you appreciate home a lot more. You know when you go on holiday and you come back and you see your friends again? It's great, isn't it? So it's that freshness that I enjoy. It makes you appreciate what's at home if you like. So it's good. Okay, good question. I like the question. Um, it t depends what the emergency is, Danny. Um, the guys, I mean, I can deal with a lot myself, but the important aspect of that statement is I need to look after myself. So I need to make sure that I'm going to be good at the stage if there's, a, there's an emergency or somebody, like exactly what happened. You know, we had an emergency life and death situation there with three guys just collapsed in front of me. So I needed to be strong enough to get those guys down the mountain. So that's kind of an answer to your question, but it, it all, all depends what happens. I think as I'm going up, I'm constantly monitoring possible situations that are happening that could, that could happen. So if there's a slope or the strong winds coming in, or in the case of, of being in the Arctic, you might have a polar bear attack, of which I've had. So, you know, let me show you a picture of a polar bear, shall I? This is cool, man. You should see this picture. Oh, let me find it. Just one second, Danny. You got any jokes, Danny, you can tell to the class before, while I'm doing this? Hang on. No. Who's the joker in your class? You don't know. Danny, why don't you share your favorite food since... Yeah, it's totally different from the shepherd's pie. I can't find one at the moment. I'm sorry, I can't. If you look online, you see how close these polar bears get to us. So, um, yeah, I, and I've had polar bears actually stick their head inside the tent in the morning. <laughs> this black nose come inside the tent, and he got his glove and smacked it on the nose, and the bear came out of the tent. And then we kept, went outside and we had to scare the bear off. So we never had to kill a bear though, which is good. We just scared them away. And that's very dangerous. There you go. <laughs> it is. I mean, the polar bear is the fastest, strongest uh, predator on the planet, and they kill humans. So you know, there's been reports around, you know, around the Arctic area of, of, of attacks and. And what we do is we, we speak to the Inuit people um, of where these bears could possibly be, where they're hunting at the moment. And then we also look at the tracks to see the depth of the tracks to see if it's new or fresh or old. Um, and then when we see a polar bear, we take photographs, but we then scare it away because they get used to it and they haven't seen humans before. So they're just inquisitive and they'll stay with you and if you get too used to you, then they'll start eating your food and maybe they might want to attack you as well. But uh, yeah, they can be very, very dangerous. They can smell up to 60 miles away. That's incredible, isn't it? And, and what colour do you think a polar bear is? White. 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 It's a great idea. If you shave a polar bear, which I don't recommend, then you'll see that there's a, it's black underneath or dark coloured, as you'd imagine. But the hair of a polar bear, and I think you'll remember this for the rest of your life, the hair of a polar bear is transparent. So you can see straight through it. What it is, it's cone shaped with a little hole at the bottom. And when the air comes around, it gets trapped inside that hair. And the hair, that, that then warms the polar bear up. It's like having a, a jacket like this with, with feathers in it. The idea is the air goes in between the feathers and warms the body up. So it's the same concept as a polar bear hair. So you've got those millions of hairs all over the polar bear, trapping all this air, and it warms the polar bear. There you go. Not bad, eh? Not bad at all. Good question, Danny. I like Thank it. You. Thanks, buddy. My question is, how long did it take to plan your trip? 
Uh, that's, a, that's a good question because it's not just about the trip, is it really? Um, you know, for the South and North Pole, it took me three or four years to put together. Convinced, because you haven't heard of me. Nobody around the world's heard of me. I'm not famous. But I get to speak to people out of Microsoft and Skype and uh, big companies around the world. And I tell them about the projects I do, but it takes a long time to put this together. So that was three years. For the Everest one, I kind of worked off the back of the North and South Pole. So I went back to the sponsors again. So it took about a year to put together. Um, and I used my own teams as well. And I've worked with them on many occasions. So it was an easier one to put together on this occasion. But uh, yeah, it's tough, it's tough. So, what do, you, what, do you know what you want to be when you leave school? Uh, yeah. Soccer player. So what's your favorite? Do you like LA Galaxy? No. We're okay. I mostly follow English soccer. So what's your favorite team? Manchester United. Oh, yeah. They've got a new manager, you know? Yeah. Uh, so Alex Ferguson's left. And, so I, was, I was at uh, in Manchester last Friday doing a TV program for children, children's TV over here. And behind the filming, about 100 yards away, was Old Trafford. So that was pretty cool. Really cool. It's nice meeting you, mate. Right? Enjoy the football. <laughs> Soccer, sorry. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Good. Good, good. My question is, how do you pitch 10? How do you like pitch a 10 in the in mountain race? That's a, that's a question I haven't had before. That's fantastic. That's really good. Um, I'm trying to think how I pitch my tent now. Because the wind is so strong, um, what you need is, imagine the wind blowing at 50 miles an hour. I mean, that's pretty strong, eh? Um, it's enough to give you a parting in your hair. Oh, you've got a parting. Um, so the wind is really strong. Um, so what we need to do is we put an anchor down. The sun is really hard in the ground. Now, if you've got ice, you can screw what we call an ice screw into the ground. And it's really rigid, and then you clip your tent up there and just let the tent go. And it's flying around like a kite. And then you, but it's not going to go anywhere. And then you bring the tent down, and you then anchor it to the ground. So the most important thing is you don't lose your tent in the strong winds. So that's actually a really good question. So. Sorry, say again. Where's the, where's the area flat when you were pitching the tent? Right, again, at, at the top of the Lotsey base, which is going up to Camp 3, it's kind of shaped like that, and at the top you've got this little ridge. So we pitched the tent on top, and then on this side, we'd have to put in the anchors and tie the tent down, because the tent would slip down the mountain. So in the morning, when I came out of the tent, or if you wanted to go to the toilet, then you'd have to actually get a carabiner and hook yourself on in case you slip down the mountain. So everything needed to be thought, thought through. So yeah, very dangerous. So you're sleeping on the edge of a 3,000 meter drop. Wow, exactly. I like your t-shirt, by the way. Very cool. <laughs> um, no, I didn't realized that I've become an explorer. I, I went into the army when I left school. Um, I then uh, went into rescue and worked for fire and rescue, so became a firefighter. Um, and then I started to do polar expeditions in between. And it wasn't until 2007, I don't know if you guys get this TV program in the States, you get a thing called Top Gear. No. Like a car program, no? Yeah. Well, one of the biggest programs in the UK and I was asked to guide them to Magnetic North Pole and that's when I left the rescue services and started going into full-time exploration. But I never really thought about it. You know, I can only, you know, it's, it's, sometimes your life takes you in different directions. What, what do you want to be, you know? Soccer players, there's a lot of soccer players there. That's good. You left or right footed? Left or right footed? Right, okay, that's good. Well, good luck with that anyway. I'll look out for you in years to come. Okay, cheers, Ray.
I think this is going to be our last one just before we wrap up. Um, uh, that's a good question. Was that prompted, that question? Did somebody tell you to ask that? <laughs> was the last one. That's a great one because, um, when was it? 2008, I cycled on uh, with a friend of mine. We bought bikes in Seattle and we cycled across the top of the states three and a half thousand miles straight into New York and we ended up being in New York then and we stayed in uh, um, what's the one across the bridge the area uh, name one Hoboken anyway we stayed just outside New York anyway but yeah I cycled there and out of all the cities that I've traveled around in the world New York, hands down, is my favourite city. London's brilliant. So I'd recommend you come to London with New York, with the galleries and the park and the food, the street salads that you can get in the bars and uh, everything that's going on with the cinemas and stuff like that is absolutely brilliant. It's a real thriving city and I loved it. I really did. So um, it was a great end to the trip. And hopefully, if I come back again, which hopefully I will do, um, then I'll give your teachers a shout and maybe I can come to your school and give you a talk there. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, Mark, I just want to thank you again on behalf of Village School and all of our students and staff who followed you. We truly appreciate connecting with us and how we can follow something that's actually happening as it's going. You know, it, it really just brings things to life as far as the history and what's going on. Rather than reading about it, we can actually experience it. That's what you bring up. Guys, uh, and that's, that's what I truly appreciate. I know everyone else does because it's a lot more interesting following something that's happening every day. And, and as I would prepare the newscast for the next day, we weren't sure what was going to happen. We weren't sure if there's going to be a report. Maybe we got to wait till the next day. Maybe you reached the summit. Maybe there was a problem. Uh, we certainly reported about the time that you slipped and fell but had your helmet on. Um, so we weren't sure what was going to happen. So every day was kind of like a little mini adventure for us, even though you were doing all the heavy lifting out there on Mount Everest. So we truly appreciate it. So boys and girls, how about a big round of applause? Can you sort of um, maybe just sort of put your hands in the air, the camera can be directed down, with you included as well. And I'll take a quick photograph that I'll put on the blog today. So, have a look later. So, that's, that's great. Let's see if we can all get in here. Yeah.